next week, hard to believe, time is flying, right? We start the fourth quarter, but the Federal Reserve still has two big moves to make. There are meetings in both November and December. So can we expect even more rate hikes? Let's dig a little bit deeper into that and the markets with Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones and Julie Beal of Kane Anderson Rudnick. Mona, I'll start with you. But a bad year. I think we're down 28 percent or something like that in the S&P 500, the fourth worst start to a year, according to Compound Capital. But I guess here's the bad news. A traditional recession, assuming we get one, the average is a 32 percent drawdown for equities. So it sounds like you think we could have more downside to come in markets. Yeah, you know, look, I think you could use that as a downside or, or maybe even an upside scenario. Think about it this way. A lot of the work to the downside in markets has already been put in through this first nine months of the year. And yes, it's been painful. And yes, it's been very difficult to fight the Fed this year, uh, both in equities and bonds, actually. Um, but, you know, if we're heading towards a scenario and we do think a recessionary environment becomes more and more likely given the size and the length of the rate hikes we're seeing, but the good news again is that we don't yet see the scope for a deep or prolonged recession. So in that backdrop, as you noted, average recessions, uh, in our analysis, down on average 34 percent in the S&P 500. We're down about 23 to 24 percent. Shallow recessions are down about 28 percent on average. So what we're looking at here is 5 to 10 percent downside. But the way you might want to think about it is, you know, if we do enter that period of volatility, that really could be your opportunity to position yourself for perhaps a more sustainable rebound in the 12 months ahead. Yeah, I mean, Julie, isn't that kind of the idea that that we want to buy low? I mean, if our timeline is next month or maybe even middle of next year, I get it. Think about it. We could be lower in six months than we are now. But if your timeline is 10 years from now, maybe even five years from now, history says that 80 percent or whatever the time, the S&P 500 is likely to be a lot higher in five and 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, for us, our point of view is you should always be fully invested because trying to pick the bottom and trying to hit it with timing is next to impossible on a consistent basis. The real gains that you make in the stock market are from time, just the amount of time you have them in the market. What I think is right now happening is you have an opportunity to find good quality companies that should be able to weather a recession um, at better valuations than before. What's tricky about knowing if we've hit the bottom or not is we've never really hit the highs that we have. You know, before you would talk about software names trading at 10 times revenue and they got to 100 times revenue. So unwinding that means we could have more to go. It's really hard to say. I just don't think it's useful to try to say this is the bottom. I think it's a fool's errand. So, Mona, I, I actually agree, I agree with what Julie had just stated. But when you look at the calendar. I'm a big seasonality person when it comes to trading. When you look at the midterms, you, you've, we've all seen the, the data on this, on this desk. 12 months out after a midterm election, the market is always higher. How much credence do you put to things like that? Or is this time different? And I hate when people say that because it's usually you just never did, different. But you just said <laughs> that. I know. So I hate myself. Yeah. No, you don't. Look, you make a good point. Um, the, yeah. Hold the me. Data, it's okay. <laughs> we've, we've all done it. Uh, no, I think the data around midterms is actually surprisingly pretty consistent. And you highlighted it well. The 12 months after midterm elections tend to be positive by a good 15 percent on average. <clears throat> so um, while history may not repeat itself exactly, we could certainly see it rhyme. And keep in mind, this time we could be getting this period after midterms that coincides with a potential Fed pause, which coincides with perhaps a period of stability in bond yields, which I think the markets are really seeking out as part of this bottoming process, and of course could coincide with a period of inflation rolling over more meaningfully. So if we get all those factors in play, uh, and we're in this post-midterm election period, some of the uncertainty is behind us, uh, that's not a bad backdrop for investors to be in, and certainly one that we're considering in the months ahead. Hey, Julie, it's Tim. How do you think about the traditional leaders and what have been the mega cap tech stocks in an environment where uh, if you're talking about longer duration tech companies, they don't totally fit that bill. And in many cases, they've been very defensive. Apple's been very defensive, uh, still trades at a big premium to the market. So uh, looking longer term, but also understanding the current market dynamic, what are you doing with some of the biggest companies in the market here? I think what's critical is to be looking at both valuation and the fundamental drivers of those businesses, right? So again, I don't view Apple and Google to be the same kind of business 
Apple is selling $1,000 phones, a consumer discretionary item, and Google has 98% of search. It's just not the same. So I, I think you can't lump them all together, and I think you have to look at the, each of them on a case-by-case -case basis and say, if demand really dries up, what happens in this business and how stable is it? Is it does it have debt? Does it have lots of variable costs? It's, I really think this becomes more and more of a stock picker's market.